Knoxville Game Design, March 2020, Promotion and Feedback, with Dylan, Levi, Ruthann, and Jared. Welcome everyone to Knoxville Game Design for March 2020. This is a monthly discussion of game development topics. Uh, currently on the line we have in Lenore City, Dylan Wolf. Hi. And in North Carolina we have Ruth Ann Manning. And I'm Levi Smith and I'm in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, I guess I'll just go around real quick and see if anybody has anything to share. Hey Ruth Ann, uh, did you have anything that you wanted to... Anything else you want to talk or share? Uh, no, not right now, except that I'm in South Carolina instead of North Carolina. Oh, you're in South Carolina. I thought you were in North Carolina. Yeah. Well, I'm across the border in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Oh, my son gosh. lives in North Carolina. Sometimes I'm over there. I got but you. But right now I'm in South Carolina. But that's not important. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, hey, Dylan, did you have anything you wanted to show off or talk about? Uh, no, I don't really have anything to show off. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and start with the news uh, today. Let's see here. Share screen. Share, share, share. Okay. Um, got my tabs here. Okay, so the first thing, we talked about this a little bit earlier on the Discord, but there's going to be an, an event at Token Game Tavern uh, for East Tennessee streamers. So I think all of us that do the streaming for Knoxville Game Design, all, all of us that do this meeting podcast, obviously we're invited to this. So this will be on the Ides of March, March 15th. That's the way I'm remembering it. Uh, looks like it goes from 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. So looks like a lot of people have signed up as interested, but nobody has signed up as going yet. <laughs> So we'll see how many people show up to this. I'm planning on going. I'm hoping to get some. I know Dylan made some cards for us and uh, and hand those out. And I want to make some new brochures and things like that. But with it coming up so soon, I may not get that done in time. So, yeah, if anybody wants to meet us and come talk to us, uh, come to this event at Token Game Tavern. Uh, we have Ludum Dare 46 coming up in April, so we'll have one more meeting before this, but I'll go ahead and remind everyone earlier that uh, Ludum Dare 46, which is twice a year now in April and October, so uh, we'll plan on doing the get-together at Panera Bread again and talk about the theme. Uh, and this one does start at 9 p.m., so we'll plan on getting together at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and then staying till the theme announcement at 9 p.m. And I guess the theme voting should be starting soon. Oh, theme suggestions are currently open, so you can suggest themes. You just got to log in, and, uh, and then the voting will probably start in a few weeks. Okay, so, so let's see who it was. Uh, someone on uh, who recommended this. Trumpet7347 in our Discord channel brought to our attention that Gudo, Godot, it looks like Godot, but it's, I think it's pronounced Gudo, is really pushing these Gudo communities. So it looks like they're trying to build communities around Gudo. I really haven't looked at this too much, but it looks like they have ways to set up uh, a channel and things like that so i'll probably look into this more looks like interesting stuff also let's see here locksmith army who's in our knox game design discord channel uh was talking with him a little bit last night and he's recommending this graphic scale or the, he said this is what he uses to do pixel art i've been using Asperite, but this is maybe another option for doing pixel art right here. So I'll probably check this out later. It looks like it's a pretty good tool. Uh, go ahead and mention Vector in Lexington, or it's near Lexington, Kentucky. It's actually Richmond, which is actually a little bit closer to us here in Knoxville, a little bit south of Lexington. It's coming up April 24th to 25th. So that's actually going to be, I believe, the weekend after Ludum Dare. So I might be able to actually attend it this year. Uh, they always have a lot of speakers and things like that. Um, looks like it's sixty dollars for two days, so I, I don't know if I I'm, I would go both days or not. Um, but it's probably worth going both days. I just don't know if I want to 
get a hotel room and everything. But uh, should be good stuff. I've never been to that one. So I'm interested in checking that out. Um, just a quick, cu- cu- a few things that I've been working on. <clears throat> one thing, if you're ever developing games, uh, if you have like, if you're, especially if you're doing like command line builds, one thing that you always want to do, and I could probably do a whole talk on this in the future, but uh, make files. It really makes building your games a lot easier. Uh, one, I was just going to share one tip because I was actually doing a full recompile of my SDL shooter game that I've been working on uh, every time. And when you start developing a game, that, that usually takes like a couple of seconds. But after you start building more and more and more, it can take up to like 30 seconds or a minute. So what you want to do is first compile your C files, if you're doing C, into object files. That way you only recompile the things that you want that you need to, the files that have changed. And then you take those object files and you use what's called a linker to link those together. But the thing that I wanted to point out is if you're doing a make file and you don't have a def- appendency defined for .o, like percent .o, colon percent dot c that means compile all your c files into object files if you don't have this specified then um it's going to come up with its own uh default comp- uh command li- or let's see here command for compiling that so when that happens you lose all your specified or specialized parameters and that caused me a lot of headaches so i got that fixed I'm also passing this dash D min GW so I can do specific things for this com- opposed to the Mac build that I have on my MacBook Pro. So yeah, I might talk about that on a future show, just make files. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Let's see here. And yeah, this is another thing that I've been working on. It's kind of nerdy, but I've been kind of going back and looking at some calculus. And so I remember a year ago I did the math for game developers talk. And at the very end of that, I said calculus is not really used in game development. Well, I'll go back and say I was kind of wrong about that. Because if you ever use a sine or cosine function uh, in your game, which is really useful for doing um, circles, moving things around a circular path, or figuring out angles and distance and things like that, you use sine and cosine quite a bit. And the one thing I never knew is how to actually calculate sine and cosine. So what they, what they have, and I remember hearing about this years ago, is the Taylor series. I think there's a spe- uh, specialized version of this called the McLaurin series, but I usually don't use that one. But with the Taylor series, you can actually calculate the value of sine and cosine. And it's this function right here. You basically use uh, the, the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, and then you raise that to uh, the two, yeah, you raise x to that power and put that all over factorial that. So what I ended up doing is I made this spreadsheet. And yeah, if anyone's out there is listening to the podcast, I recommend checking out the video so you can see this. But basically I went 1 through 10, and then I calculated what I'm just calling alpha, which is basically the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And then you alternate between 1 and negative 1. Uh, so for every other term, you either add or subtract. And I found out there's, and this could be used in other ways in games, if you need an alternating 1 and negative 1. Uh, this is a neat little shortcut. You can do negative 1 to the n power, where n is a integer that's incremented. So that will give you a 1 or a negative 1. So uh, what I did here is I did negative 1 to the n minus 1, which starts at 1 instead of negative 1. Then you just do uh, that value to the uh, that power, to 2n minus 1 power, all over 2n minus 1 factorial. And what I think is interesting right here, so I got this in Excel right here, in four terms, it, it, it converges to that value for like a degree of 30, it converges to 0.5. For 45 degree angle, it converges in like six terms. So you don't have to do this computation very far out. You can do it four or five times. Um, for 270 degrees, then it takes like eight terms. But you can get within four decimal places fairly quickly. And you can go in here and like change this to let's say 70 degrees and it'll automatically update that 
So I thought that was interesting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, promoting your game. So this month's topic is promoting your game and uh, handling feedback. So I don't have too much this month, but I did want to mention Open Broadcaster is a good tool. You can find it at obsproject.com. And most people use this for like streaming on Twitch and things like that. But you can also use it for recording gameplay videos. And I'm not going to go into all the details of that. I'll, <laughs> one reason is because I'm currently using it to record this. Um, so I really don't want to monkey around with OBS too much right now. Uh, but yeah, it's got a lot of options for specifying like what recording format you want to use. I typically use MP4s for capturing offline video. For podcasts, I usually do TS. Uh, and I don't know what TS stands for, but the important thing about that is if you have a crash, which has happened on this podcast before, uh, if you do MP4, then you lose the entire thing. Uh, MP4 has to be finalized for it to be stable, but it's fine for doing quick videos. Uh, so yeah, once you have your video captured for your game, then I use this tool called Videoland VLC Player. And then what I do is... For instance, here's a video of the game that I've been working on, the SDL Shooter. You just go into Media, Open File, and then find the MP4 file. And I'm just pulling this out of the Open Broadcaster Directory in MP4. So what you want to do is there's an option right here called uh, Advanced Controls. So you just turn that on right there. And it'll give you like four additional buttons right here. So what I do is I go through my gameplay video and find something, like if I've already done my game and everything, and I want to make some screenshots, I just go through here, find something interesting, like these bugs right here. So it's like, okay, this is pretty cool. Let's find a place where I'm shooting. So you can use this little uh, forward triangle button and you can go frame by frame through this and then you can find like the exact frame that you want so it's like okay i want one that's red and another one that's falling apart so that looks pretty good right there so then you just go to video and then take snapshot so by default i forget which directory it puts that in but you can go to view and then or no tools and preferences and then go to video and then down here under video snapshots you can specify the directory where you want those snapshots to go and also specify a prefix if you want them all to start with the same file name and sequential numbering and things like that so what i want to do is go to that folder screenshots and here in my screenshot there's s0001.jpg so i think there's also an option to um, save it as a PNG or whatever file format you want. But yeah, anybody out there, if you if you're having issues taking screenshots or because I know I've tried to do it before, where I play the game and use like alt print screen or print screen at the same time, not a good way to do screenshots. I highly recommended recommend doing it this way. Uh, there are other tools out there as well, like. Uh, Adobe Premiere Elements. I use that sometimes too for using screenshots, but this is a, a way that you can do it for free. Okay, so a little bit about promotion. Uh, here's a couple of sites. Uh, NDDB, I've used this for quite a few years. I don't know how many people still check this out, but it's a good place to go post your games. You can post screenshots and things like that, and you can see how many people are looking at it and post information about your game. I think they can actually host builds as well on NDDB. Uh, another good site is Unity Connect. Uh, this is primarily for Unity games, but it's a nice place to go to post videos and screenshots of your games and get other people looking at it. It does require an account to post projects, and also, I think if you, in order to avoid going through their approval or, so if you don't, uh, you have to actually assign like a two-factor authentication to this, to your account for you to be able to post your game without additional pr approval. Uh, if you don't have the two-factor authentication, I got like this app on my phone, which generates uh, secure numbers, tokens for you. 
Uh, so if you don't have that, then it's a little bit harder to post on here. But yeah, de definitely recommend uh, checking out Unity Connect. I think you can also post non-Unity games on here because whenever you post a game, you just go, oh, here's the thing about two-factor authentication. I'll just skip that for now. So you can like, pick a game, uh, like you want to post a web game or images and videos. I'll just say images and videos. So you type in the name of your game, a description, then you can upload photos and things like that. Um, and then thumbnails and what platforms it's on, languages and uh, links if it's on a store and things like that. Tags, the website that it points to and things like that. I wonder if I can go back to one of my, get out of this, go back to one of my other games. Connect Unity. The site isn't the easiest to navigate. I think you got to click here and then dashboard. Hopefully this doesn't show. <laughs> Let me pull that over for a second. I don't know what that's about to show. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let me click on that right there. So yeah. So here's one for the alphabet soup game and it gives you some information. I don't know. Should be a way to edit the game, but I'm not seeing it here right now. I think I was going to say, I've never used Unity Connect, but I think that's a really good idea for promotion. Because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I know I moved everything over to Itch.io at one point, so I had all my games in one place under one link. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also looked at, like, there's sites like Linktree that will let you build just kind of like a profile page with a bunch of links. Oh, I've never heard but, of Linktree. Is that, is that L-I-N-K tree? Yeah, I believe so. Linktree. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think the idea of, I think you definitely want to have just one URL because I, th one of the mistakes I made was I printed up, uh, business cards for each little game that I released. Mm -hmm. And after a while you're left with a bunch of business cards you can't really use. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Just have one place where everybody can go to, to get to all your stuff. Otherwise you're just trying to like herd cats or find all these places where you have stuff listed and everything. Um, let's see here. So you can click on games and then edit project. So this is kind of like an example game where you have the background there and screenshots. and the description. So I always just like point people back to my home site right there. Um, yeah, so that's about it. But yeah, I want to check out Linktree. It looks like you have to create an account in order to use this. And yeah, it essentially gives you a URL, and, and it's really simple. It's just a list of links. Oh, okay. But it is, it is something that you could stick on a business card or something like that and see everything like everything that you've got to offer in one place. Oh, okay. So this doesn't actually host your project. This kind of just points. No. Out. no. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But whether you use something like that or unity connect, I, I do think it's a good idea to have everything in one place. Yeah, that is a good idea. And I always recommend is like, yeah, if you can afford it and definitely get a domain name, a dot com, like Dylan is Dylan Wolf.com. I'm Levi D Smith.com. And, and make sure you know what, what domain you want to use because you're stuck with that for a, a long time. Um, let's see here. So that was Unity Dashboard. Oh, yeah, so I do have this uh, talk that I did, and I'm not going to go over this, but I did talk on social media back in 2015 at Dev Space in Huntsville. A lot of this is out of date. It's like I don't even recommend Twitter or YouTube anymore just because it's so hard to get found on there anymore. Uh, WordPress, some of this stuff is still good. And the SEO stuff, is, it's just so hard to get found anymore. Uh, Google Alerts and Analytics, that, that's fine, but it's still... Uh, yeah, I mentioned NDDB right here. And there's another site, Zebra Strut. And I don't know if that site exists anymore. Facebook, again, it's hard to get found. Reddit... Um, yeah, you can post on Reddit. And we had some discussion on our Discord about this, and sometimes that makes people angry if you post your site on on Reddit. Google Plus doesn't exist anymore. Stumble upon Green Light doesn't exist anymore. 
Yeah. I think a lot of the difficulty with posting on things like Reddit, especially Reddit, is your. It's kind of like forums back in the day where if you just kind of drive by and throw your link out there, mm -hmm. I understand why that would bother people. Yeah. It, which is tough because promotion kind of means like you have to get into a community before you can self promote. And that's not, it's not necessarily what all of us do. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm not super active. And I know people have done that on the, I think somebody did that recently on the Facebook Knox game design group. It's like, Oh, I'm new here. And here's a link to a board game thing. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I don't care. But uh, I, I I, I think there is some context like that. That's for local people, so yeah. that's a little bit different than. As long as it's local, I'm fine with it. Yeah. Okay. So the second part of this talk was going to be feedback, and I guess I'll go ahead and start. I just made some notes. I didn't do slides this month. Uh, I'll pull that over to the side. So I was just going. I really don't deal with feedback that much. Um, most of it I ignore <laughs> unless it's local people. So if I have like, if I probably said this before, but if I do a Ludum Dari entry and I post it, then I see it's like, okay, did Dylan comment on it? Did Jacob comment on it? I'll read those. The rest of them is like, okay. I'm. Sometime I'll, sometimes I'll look through them, but, uh, the types of feedback I get is like the first type is out of scope feedback. That's what I'm calling it. So it's like, okay, I made a Tetris game. And somebody comes back and says, hey, why didn't you make Mario Brothers? <laughs> so that's kind of like at the uh, the CreepyCon thing. It's like, hey, can I play Call of Duty here? It's like, no, that's really not what we do or anything. Or that's not the game that we made. So, yeah, I, I don't find that type of feedback helpful. Uh, a lot of times I show people my games and they say, have you played Game X? Or have, have you played this or that? I was like, well... I do play some games in my spare time, but uh, just because I'm a game developer, I haven't played all the games in the world or anything. I know I sound really negative, <laughs> but I'm just going over some of the types of feedback that I get. Uh, and the other type of feedback that I really love is when you tell somebody, show somebody your game, and they say, hey, I have an idea for a game. <laughs> And it's like, okay, that's great. And you just try to be nice and not say, uh, okay, that's a good idea. But the, the ones I really like are the ones where people say, hey, I have, I have this idea and I'm starting to work on it. Or here's what I've done so far. Uh, but just because you have an idea for a game. Uh, yeah, that, that's and I have other opinions. Like everybody's got an idea for a game. But yeah, I mean, just for small talk, that's fine too. So it doesn't bother me too much. Uh the other type of feedback that I see, especially for Game Jam games, like the Ludum Dares and the ones that are created in 48 hours, are, it's like, okay, I make like a, a Tetris game, or I don't know, like I make Mario Brothers, and then they'll say, hey, why didn't you create eight levels for this, and why don't you have this power up, and why don't you have this and that? It's like, okay, it's a Game Jam. This was made in 48 hours. <laughs> So it's good. I mean, I, I welcome that, but it's like, okay, that's really, it's the type of thing is like, yeah, if I did have a few months to work on this, then these are things I definitely would have uh, added to the game. The ones, the ones that I really like, not being sarcastic, are uh, when people tell me actual things that are broken in the game. And I've had a few, few people, I'll say, hey, can you go out and play? And they'll actually tell me hey, this isn't work or this is glitching and things like that. So that's the best type of feedback that you can get. Uh, I think I had some feedback like that with that Yahtzee game that I developed and somebody's like, hey, the dice got stuck or it didn't come up with the right value or something like that. I mean, that's the best type of feedback that a game developer can get is the actual like, bug reports and things like that. And that also shows that they've actually played the game. Um, and that's another thing is like people that come to you and they say, Hey, do you want to come work on my game or can I work on your game or one of my games? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And they don't know any of the games that you've made. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if you want to work on a game together, at least check out and see the stuff that I've developed first, uh, before you ask things like that. 
So the worst type of, of uh, feedback that I can get, uh, either positive or negative, is on the negative side is like your game sucks, or on uh, the other side is your game is great. It's like, okay, it's kind of the same thing. It's like this is, I mean, it's nice to hear that, uh, but uh, it's really not helping me either way. Uh, okay. And yeah, the, the other type of bad feedback is the one that where somebody's obviously just tr like trying to cut you down. And I've experienced this with this a little bit locally. It's like, okay, I remember my first Xbox Live indie games and, and people were just like, oh yeah, that game's not going to do anything. Here's where your dreams die and all this. It's like, yeah, you just don't need to be that negative. Just try to help build each other up and things like that. And, but I've also got good, uh, Good feedback locally. I remember when I was doing the Resistor game for Xbox Live Indie Games, um, I had this really kooky control scheme where you could change the resistors and switch it to a wire using the bumper button. I remember somebody's like, oh, well, why don't you just put the wire on the A button? I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So things like that are, are really helpful. Just having a different set of eyes, look at your game, and think of different ways that you can do things. And... And the other thing that I've uh, had a problem with on Game Jam games is, especially for Ludo Madari, I'll go in and submit my game. It'll be on Itch.io or wherever. And I'll start seeing ratings come in, but I can go to my download statistics and page statistics and nobody's played the game. So it's like, okay, that's why I really don't take Ludo Madari uh, writing seriously anymore because obviously people are just going out and writing them and not even playing the games uh yeah so that's all the uh rants that i have on feedback hey, <laughs> hey dylan did you have any uh opinions on feedback <laughs> um yeah i actually had a couple different ideas on on promotion since you'd mentioned it oh, on yeah. the uh, Sorry. but but yeah feedback is one of those things that is tough um, it is a, it is a skill to learn how to read a comment and go, this is actually constructive or I need to throw this away. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot, like I've gone to board game, like a board game design event, um, here locally a couple months ago. And it's really interesting to watch that sort of feedback and how people react to that feedback. Um, because a lot of it is, hey, your game is seems like it's trying to do this, but it's doing this other thing really well, and you kind of have to make a choice. That I think that's different than your game should, you know, you've got Tetris and it should be Mario Brothers or something. Um, but a lot of that is being able to sit down with the person playing it and see how they're responding to it, as opposed to just taking comments off the internet because, you know, like pe people have to like earn that, that level of trust to be able to say the, uh, you know, to give you the constructive criticism. Yeah. I definitely um, take uh, in-person feedback more, uh, I guess, seriously than just a random comment on the internet, especially from people. You yeah. Know. And you can also, you can also like watch them play the game and also pick up some things that, like, see what they're assuming and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I remember in college they used to call that Wizard of Oz, like, <laughs> testing. I don't know why it was called Wizard of Oz, but where you actually sit down and watch somebody play. Or I think in that case it's like you use a computer system, and then you can really see where they're getting hung up and, and things like that. Yeah. But that's a big problem for us. I mean, for I mean, not for board games, for... for video games when you post it online you never do actually see anybody playing the game unless they make a gameplay video of it yeah and you there's no easy way to see like to get an idea of what their assumptions are unless they either write it out explicitly or you can kind of like read between the lines yeah. like okay you were trying to do this you expected it to be this type of game it's not what does that mean <laughs> Yeah, because it's hard to get inside somebody's brain yeah. to see what they're actually thinking. I think that's part of the Wizard of Oz thing where you get people to write down their 
thoughts but it's really hard to get somebody to do that for free <laughs> i mean yeah unless they're just like really into it and just want to play your game or something but i don't know like the like the game design event i went to and i think i think they do one of those uh regularly here there are people who are into playing like trying new board games trying new video games because you still have to speak the same game design language to do that mm -hmm. Like, even if I'm not the one writing the code, I still have to know, like, okay, what what are you going for here? What, like, what mechanics are you using? Can I speak the same language that you're speaking? <clears throat> yeah, because I remember, like, for that Yahtzee game that I did, uh, I got some of my coworkers to play it. I was like, hey, you want to check it out? And they're actually developers. They're not game developers. But like you're saying, we kind yeah. of talk the same language. They say, okay, this, 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 and this. And it's a little bit easier to get feedback from them other than, like, family members who don't know anything about software development at all. Yeah. It seems like better comments. Um. I mean, I had a I had a couple of thoughts on promotion in general. Yeah, if you want go me for it. Um, one, I think you kind of talked about this when you were mentioning, like, you know, putting stuff on different sites. Um, the res it doesn't always guarantee results. I find it. I, let me back up. I'm I'm gonna. I am a hobbyist developer, and that is kind of the way I think about this. If you're an actual like for-profit indie developer who's trying to make this a day job, you're going to think a different way. Um, and I've also never had a whole lot of experience or uh, success um, distributing something. Um, one is to think about stores as distribution channels rather than discovery. Um, so just because you put something on Google Play or the App Store or Steam or whatever, or even Itch.io, doesn't mean someone's going to find it. It's a good way for someone to download it and potentially someone to pay you money for it. It is not necessarily going to sell the game. You may need to do other things to do that. And if, if you set that expectation ahead of time that you're not just going to throw it out there and search is going to do something from, for you, I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, and the second thing is just, set your expectations like I, I know a lot of the you know like you were saying the wait for your dreams to die sort of talk is is really negative but there is a kernel of of truth in it like you have to set your expectations zero downloads is a possible <laughs> result it's it's um you know i know i've put games out that i can name everyone who downloaded it you know i've given people um beta test keys and they did not redeem them. You know, you can, um, it, it's not necessarily going to do as well as you think. And that's fine. You just have to kind of go in. Um, and especially if you're someone like me who enjoys like the coding more than the actual marketing, like I was saying earlier, if you, to market in some places, you have to go into a community, and if you're not interested in joining that community, that may not work for you. You probably need to work with someone who can do marketing, but that's getting a little further outside of the, the hobbyist space. Yeah. Um, I definitely think getting to know the people who run the platform that you're targeting, like if you want to target Xbox, getting to know the... Microsoft people is probably a good thing to do. Like, I know sometimes yeah. they show up at MomoCon. I talked to one woman that was there. So I think the more you know those people, the more doors open up rather than if you're just, hey, I'm going to sit in. And that's what I do. I just sit in my living room and, like, throw it out there. Yeah. It's kind of like pl planting vegetables. It's like, yeah, if you just go out there and throw the seeds down and expect them to grow, then you're not going to have a good of a chance as, as if you yeah. actually go out there and water your seeds and plant them properly and all that good stuff. Yeah. And the thing is, there's nothing wrong with doing games like that. Like, if you're just in it for the love of building games, then that's completely acceptable, but... Just keep your day uh, job. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you, you set your expectations accordingly. Um, don't, don't think that this is going to blow up and make you... 
I, I know we kind of had that discussion when uh, Mike and I started doing XBLIG games of like, I think he he thought this could turn into something. I was like, I I don't think it can. And I, I think we all watched Indie Game the movie, and I think that made so many people think that hey, I can make a game and become a millionaire, and it's really not that easy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's becoming hard. Like the fact that I am doing game development is occurring in large part because the tools are more accessible. And if I can do game development, a whole lot of other people can do game development and that pool is bigger. And so it's harder to stand out. Um, yeah. The difficulty is definitely a factor. The one thing I was going to say is like the kitties adventure game. It's finally went over 50,000 acquisitions on between Xbox live, or not Xbox live, Xbox one creator and windows store. And I think the reason it was like, I don't, I don't want to call it a success because it didn't make any money. I mean, yeah. I put it out there as a free game. By far, it's the most downloaded game that I had. Uh, one thing was, is like we had those events at like Emory Place Block Party and the Maker Palooza, and I kind of had like three or four games out there, and everybody went to the Kitty's Adventure, like the kids loved it. It's like, oh, I need to focus like, yeah. more on my attention on this game and not these other ones. But I think the big factor was I was the first Unity game on the Xbox one creator's program so being first i remember this was like a lesson with uh oh what's the space uh space racing game that was on playstation uh wipeout like wipeout was always a launch title for all the playstation consoles and it always had a lot of buys just because it was the first game I think yeah it, that's i think that's kind of the same thing with the kitty game as i was the first Unity game on the creators program. Now, it didn't have lots of uh, promotion or anything or visibility, but in the creator section, it did show up like number one and free downloads and, and recent and all that. Um, but the thing is, going back to what you said, Dylan, is it took a lot of work on my part figuring out how to get a Unity game on there. And nobody else knew how to do that. <laughs> yeah. At the time. I know I've got like. I think that the game that I put on an actual app store that had the most downloads was I put uh, Ice Fishing Derby, which was a Let em Dare game I did, for free on Amazon Fire TV, I think. Mm -hmm. And that number has been, the last time I checked, it was pretty high. But I think it's because like there's not a ton of games on that platform, um, or at least that use like controller and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's a good example of like setting your expectations is like, understand that, um, you're going to do well if you go, if you get something out there first, but just throwing something out there on an app store by itself doesn't, doesn't actually change anything. Yeah. That reminds, um, reminds me, there's a book and it talks about red oceans, the blue ocean strategy. I haven't read this book, but I kind of get the point of where it's going. Uh, they talk about these red oceans and blue oceans. Basically, the red oceans are where all the sharks are. And this is, like, where everybody currently is. And, like, all the sharks are currently eating everything up because everybody's already done this before. So what the yeah. point of this book is to go to the blue oceans, go to where nobody else currently is, and you'll have a lot more success. Um, the, the difference is, like, the red ocean is very clearly, like, the – the mainstream, the most popular. Um, and, and, like, this is one thing I noticed at CreepyCon, like, hardcore gamers are not going to play my games, but kids seem to really like them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's true for a lot of indie games because, you know, kids come to something with different expectations than I would. They probably have to, a more open game. mind. It's like, hey, what's this? Yeah. Whereas the hardcore gamers, I mean, they're, I don't know, they... They like what they've been playing. They, they kind yeah. of know what they like. And, and I've heard, like, marketing talks like that. It's like, yeah, if you've always bought Brand X of uh, Razor Blades for the last 20 years, you're pr there's probably no ad in the world that's going to make you buy Brand Y of Razor Blades just because that's what you've used your entire life. Yeah. Or you're going to go searching for the exact perfect game, which, if, if I'm honest, like, any game I've built is not the perfect game in that genre. There are better games in that genre. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, so that it kind of leads into my third point, like set your expectations and then um, make sure that you're not just reacting 
to the response you get. Think about think about how you're handling it because I know as a hobbyist game developer, if you come in with a lot of like high expectations, it's gonna burn you out. Um, it's gonna be really tough. And if you can kind of scale those down, it doesn't hit so hard. Um, but but yeah, you need to think about what you want. Like one reason I've um, I've kind of backed off from doing a lot of game development is it's hard to it's hard to go through that cycle of like put something out there, get a few hits, but you know the the amount of feedback you get doesn't necessarily line up with the amount of time you put into it. And so be a little more choosy, like do something because you want to do it, not not necessarily because of the reaction you think it's going to get. Um, yeah, making the game is just half the battle. It's like putting it on different platforms. I mean, it can take days, I know, to get what stuff on Xbox. And I, I'm sure yeah. you remember the evil checklist and all that back in yeah. GRG. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, is that worth it? Well, it is. Like, early on, it's definitely worth it to just have something out there that feels really good. Later, it's like, if you don't get the response that you're expecting it it can kind of be a letdown it's it's it was really easy to do is just like well i'm gonna put put out something bigger and better on there it's like eh, slow down and and you know think about why you're doing it because just because you do something bigger and better doesn't mean it's gonna sell well um yeah and a lot of those games have like huge marketing teams behind them and if it's like people yeah. like you and me, we don't have huge marketing teams behind us to, to really push our games. Yeah, and and the thing is, like, because it's your game, that's your baby out there, mm-hmm. and you need to be aware of it. Like, I know, like, looking at some of the Steam Greenlight like comments that you and other people have gotten, like, that would have like that would have broken me. <laughs> uh, just like, I don't want to do that because it, it has an effect. You don't think you don't think the troll comments have an effect, but they do. Yeah. And, you know, you need to take that into account with what you're doing. I think it must be like a masochist or something. I just like the, <laughs> I just like people throwing stones at me. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there is a, there is a sense in which that feels good. Cause at least you're getting a reaction, mm-hmm. but I know it wouldn't be something I would be aware of, but I know that would bring me down. Yeah. So it's like, Okay, I'm not gonna go there. It would be really cool to have something on Steam, but holy crap, you know, you're just getting exposed to people who want to sift through and make negative comments. Why would I do that to myself? Greenlight was brutal. I think there were just people that like trolled troll the Greenlight games all day and just yeah. I don't know if you other yeah. people were on Greenlight and I was like, yeah, those comments could be pretty brutal there. Yeah, it's just like and. That's not to say don't do it, but think about what you want out of a game, especially as a, a hobbyist game developer where you're kind of like your mental state is tied to your game. It's your baby. Think about what you want. Think about what you don't want to do. Think about, you know, um, what your expectations are and how likely they are to happen and, you know, what it's going to, you know, how you're going to feel about it if they they don't get mad. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I can't think of any other uh, anything else on feedback. Uh, but yeah, like you said, it's like yeah, you do it because you love it. Don't do it because you think you can make a million dollars or anything. or or if you want to make a million dollars, that's a very different pathway, and you have to make some very different choices. And going back to what you said, it's like, well, you can take an existing formula and improve on that, because I know that's what Blizzard has made millions of dollars doing, is like they took, uh, I don't know, like the standard RTS and turned that into War- Warcraft and Starcraft, and they weren't the first MMO on the block, and they weren't the first FPS on the block, but they took those formulas and polished them really well and made a lot of money, but they also have huge development teams behind those games as well. Um but yeah, I just wouldn't do anything like too different. I mean, the more different your game is than what people are used to, the more it's going to take over, take 
to get people to understand what your game is. And that's one thing I remember Chris Gardner at Code Stock told me one time when I did the Resistor game. It was like, well, it's a decent game, but people just didn't understand what was going on. It was kind of like a pipe yeah. type game. It was like, yeah, people just didn't, just didn't get it. <laughs> I've had I've gotten those comments on a lot of their games. It's like, but it seems so clear, yeah, because I spent an entire weekend doing nothing but writing it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's clear to me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I guess that's. Uh, let me go ahead and plug a few things here. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, I wanted to mention I found Nash Game Dev. They're to the west of us. On I forty Nashville. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, they've had some. Uh, oh, uh, they had the tornado that came through. So I hope everybody in Nashville game dev-, dev is doing well. But they kind of have like what we have on Knox Game Design. Am I sharing this out? Let me share a screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Nash Nash Game Dev. It's actually Nash Game dot Dev. Is their website, and they have a local developers page, kind of like what we have. So if you're looking for more Tennessee developers, they got all of their uh, pages linked off here, kind of like what we have, and also links to their social media. So if you're looking for more Tennessee developers, I definitely recommend checking them out right here. I don't know how often they have meetings or anything. I've always wanted to go over. Seems like they were kind of not on a set schedule or anything, but they do have a Discord as well. I know I've gone to some of the uh, events that or the panels at MTAC uh, that some of the guys there, uh, John Sensei, and I think a couple other people who go to those. No, um, is John Sensei in Nashville? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I know. I saw him with the booth at uh, MomoCon. I thought he's like Atlanta or somewhere. I think he's out of there because oh, okay. uh, I think he actually talked about that in one of his panels, like that game game dev group. Monthly meetups, uh, but they don't have like upcoming events. There you go. So it looks like they. Yeah, I don't like this site. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Let's see here. So, yeah, check them out. Also wanted to mention Knox Devs. Looks like their schedule is kind of plain right now, which is fine. Maybe they, this just hasn't updated for March or something. But go check them out. Uh, uh, I know they have a lot of groups in the area. If you're looking for other things beside game dev, like .NET and UX, I think we're a part of like the, uh, the Knox Knox Devs organization somehow or something. At least we're on their page right here. Yeah, so let's see here. I think that's it. Uh, everybody check out Dylan Wolf on DylanWolf.com. Is Dylan Wolf on Twitter? Oh, hey, Ruthann, did you have anything else you wanted to share this week? Yes, I do. I was just waiting for you to ask. Me. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> I've actually been doing programming since last month. So. Awesome. Awesome. You want to know what I did? Yeah, what, what, what language are you using? Are you using Scratch again? Scratch, and um, we're doing some Raspberry Pi stuff. And also, I wanted to say something about the Vive. Which which one you want to hear first? Uh, talk <laughs> about the Vive. <laughs> oh, okay, the Vive. We're not programming on the Vive, but I just wanted to say that John has it set up to where you're not just sitting in the room watching these people moving their arms around and stuff. He's got a screen set up, a computer set up, where he shows exactly what the one playing the game is seeing. So you're seeing what they're doing. You're not seeing them doing it. You, you know what I'm saying. You can see them moving around what their movements are, but you can actually see the results of what they're doing in there. Yeah, I know yeah. I've done some uh, VR programming, and there's a way in the Steam VR like middleware program that you can say view what the person on the headset is viewing. So you can kind of, if Correct. you're doing a demo, you can actually know what the person is looking at. Yeah, that's what he does. He's got that set up to do that. I don't think that's 
that's not an automatic thing. I think he had to do something to make that work. Um, but now that's not me programming. But what I've done the last time I think we talked, I said something about I was just starting to do some scratch games for my grandchildren. Yeah. So my yeah. audience is very different from your audience. Mine is, well, actually, I did them for four grand, all four of my grandchildren, but only um, two of them have actually looked at what I made. I can tell you what I made is not important, but one of them is a pawn game. Oh, okay. and, and that one was really cool. My son actually liked that one. And then he, he liked this one, but I haven't completely finished it. I took one of the London Dari games that I made called Mar Monster Me and tried to um, convert that to Scratch, which is not all that easy. Um, but then the other programming that we've done is on those pies. Um, the one I worked on was the fruit game. Have you seen that? Uh, Who you? Okay, what you do is you have these sensors and you stick them down in a fruit and you have that um, that particular sensor associated with the sound. So the one we've worked on so far is an eggplant. We stuck a sensor down in the eggplant and my daughter was playing, I mean, my granddaughter was playing um, drums by, you know, just tapping on the eggplant. So mm -hmm. that was pretty much fun. And then in the future on the other pie that we have, uh, he wants to program it to where when his kids get older, they can't go into his beer room and pull the, pull those levers and get boot, uh, get beer. Oh, wow. So uh, oh, wow. he'll have a face recognition program on that. He also will have it programmed to know exactly how much beer he has left in any of the three kegs that he has. And so. Oh, I'm, I used to watch oh, Bar Rescue. Okay. It seems like they had a program that would detect how much is left in every bottle. I think it's called <laughs> yeah. bartender or something like that. But I like the facial yeah. recognition to get into like the, the wine cellar or the, or the <laughs> beer locker there. Yeah, well, it's, it's like just one room where the kids can get in. So he wants to make sure that they don't do what my daughter did when she was growing up. She would take the bottle and drink some out and then put water in so that I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't drinking out of it so, so that I wouldn't know. But anyway, he doesn't want that to happen. So those are the things we're doing. So the fact that I'm actually doing some programming makes me very happy. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. I'm glad you're sticking with it. I know you've been programming for quite a while. It's going to bring up your. Let me share out your site there. Now the, the no, no, don't bring it up. It's I not that. Bring great. it up. <laughs> no. I like your games. So <laughs> Reese Ann is on our. Not game design or oh, I'm just going to bring up your Ludum Dari games, and uh, yeah, she's a uh, Transeve, Edicio, and also Mima Surrendered. Um, oh, Mima Surrendered is a website, and that's not really a game. Oh, okay. Mima Surrendered. Is if people want to find out more about you and things like that, they can go there. But you yeah. made a lot of games. I remember the Fair Damsel in Distress and. <laughs> I, I remember this one it is made in processing the power transform. Or one of them is kind of like uh, uh, the Angry Birds, where you could like shoot things or slingshot things. And oh yeah, I had more than one shooter game. Um, I had one with with uh, I don't think it's out there though, but I had one with Superman. A lot of Superman flying, and you were actually shooting at the Superman. Some of those uh, bad characters in that, so the bad people were hitting. The good people. I, I don't know. I, you remember that when we had some I, kind I remember of thing. The Superman game. I think that was your first Ludum Dare game. No, my first one was um, Penguins. Penguins? Oh, Kryptonator was that one. Yeah, the yeah. one. But it wasn't my first one. I had um, a couple before that that I made. But oh, okay. yeah, I, I had a lot of fun making them. But um, and they were all in processing, and you know they were. Yeah, here's a uh, Monster Me right here. So you had two or three different versions of it. Yeah, but Monster Me, the thing about Monster Me was, is that when my son tried to play it, it is, um, uh, what do you call it? Like, I can't think of the word. I got hit on the head the other day. I mean, I, oh, no. <laughs> so I have been to think. Oh, I mean, I had a huge, huge knot on my head. It's still there, but it's gone down some. Oh. But I find my memory isn't very good. But, um, What's the word? Web web browser. Yeah. yeah. I found it that it's web browser dependent. So, oh. you know, I forget which one he was using, but it was flickering. Yeah, when he tried to do it. Uh, <laughs> Firefox seems to be playing okay. But, yeah, it's pretty nice. You can just click on it, and it automatically Please. starts and everything. Yeah. Oh, that's Kryptonator. Who is yeah. it? Who's that character? Uh, Let's I forget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, start game. Yeah, I remember this yeah. one. 
Yeah, and I had a woman uh, uh -oh. you could also play with. Is that one working? Yeah, this one's a really, this is a different game. So you got the Superman, so you're the bad guy, and you got the shield level, and you try to avoid the Superman characters. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you tried to shoot him. Oh, you shoot him? Yeah, I think oh, you, you get press, them. You press you space bar to bar shoot. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, I did make some interesting ones, I guess. Yeah, this is really good. And you've made a lot of games over the yeah. years. I think that's the great thing about Ludum Dare and game jams in general. It kind of forces you make, to make something quick in a weekend. Yeah, this is really good how you have, like, all the physics built in. And yeah, that's Box 2D. But now, I, I took some of the – I didn't actually do the Box 2D – well – Actually, some of these, I, uh, a lot of them, I would just find an example, and then I did a lot of modifications of them, but I didn't do them, like from scratch like you probably do. No, well, <laughs> what I'm doing, uh, I'm kind of doing the collision myself, but a lot of people just use Box 2D. I think it's built into Unity, and yeah. uh -huh. I don't know if Game Maker uses it. I know Stencil, I think, uses Box 2D, so yeah, nobody writes collision detection no. themselves unless you're crazy like me. <laughs> yeah. One of the examples that I used and modified did write its own physics, but um, uh, it's not as good as this one, which uses box to me. Yeah, this feels very stable <laughs> and solid. Well, you also realize that I didn't make any games back then unless I was making them for Ludum Dari. Yeah. I would make them one weekend, then I wouldn't do anything till the next <laughs> weekend, you know, so... So I wasn't very serious about it, but I enjoyed, I, I like programming and um, I liked uh, the language that you used in processing. I should say that my son is doing a lot of programming now using Flutter. Flutter? I've never heard of Flutter. Never heard of Flutter? No. Oh, you should look at that. Um, is it F-L-U-D-D-E-R? No, T-T. F-L-U-T-T-E-R. Okay. Flutter. Yeah, and it's like a one of the latest and greatest upcoming things and he's got some videos um i will send them to you videos online where he um uh, does you know demos and teaching teaching i should say of flutter but um what he does is he brings up a um, um, simulator for um for mac and simulator for windows mm -hmm. and he's got them both on there and when he makes changes in the program they both automatically update just really fast wow. and wow. so he makes some pretty pretty interesting apps and his beta tester for looking at those videos is his mother oh, <laughs> i'm sure he has wow. another one too, too but i'm getting to where i'm learning flutter too i forgot about that i believe i could program in it but i don't have a motivation but um he did a training for uh, some people out in texas and then when i looked at the video the um subtitles were the most interesting part because they were like raunchy you know, oh, <laughs> they, were no. not good, <laughs> they were not good subtitles i won't give you some examples but what he did was he went in by hand using some program he found and changed the sub titles you know to be the actual words but i don't know if it's his country accent or what it was but they got some really interesting subtitles yeah i have opinions on like putting bad things like if you're writing code and you put bad things in there or if you put i don't know it, well, always, he didn't, it always comes he back didn't do it intentionally like, oh, it was didn't? that automatic oh no 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 it was auto the automatic um subtitles that were generated by the program that the woman used to to program his. It, it was an online di video, oh. and I mean, real time. I mean, a real time video, and the the subtitles that came up out of that program were horrible. You know, I'm t <laughs> and so when I found them, John found them too. So he took another program and basically dubbed different subtitles. You know, he took every one of them and just a little at a time he fixed them. Mm -hmm. So that took mm -hmm. a lot of time, I guess. Yeah, anyway, that's, yeah. that's an irrelevant thing, but you might want to yeah. look at the subtitles if you make something like that that automatically generates subtitles. So Flutter <laughs> is de developed by Google and Community. Um, and, yeah, it's first released. Is it based on Dart? Is it related to Dart somehow? Yeah. I don't. Do you know anything about Dart? I don't know anything about Dart either. No, but I just 
I've watched enough of his videos to have some buzzwords. Developed by Google. Yeah, this is all new to me. I think as I get older, it feels like my computing skill. I feel like I still have development skills, but I'm not as good as keeping up with the latest and greatest thing that's out there. But yeah, it's all the flutter, and it looks like it's object oriented. It looks like you got mm -hmm. glasses, and it looks a lot like. Oh yeah, you do. It looks, looks a lot like. Go ahead. It looks a lot like like C sharp or Java or whatever. Yeah, well, it looks what a little saying, yeah. bit like Lisp, where you have like these embedded uh, uh, or nested parentheses, mm -hmm. and it looks a little bit like JSON, where you have like yeah. an attribute and value pair so i don't know maybe it's kind of like a mishmash of a whole bunch of different things i'll get links to the to his videos um that are public oh, and okay. i'll just email them to you because he's my son but he's a pretty good teacher so i i, I learned a lot in a yeah. you know three or four yeah. videos so yeah. i think i could program it is what i'm trying to say after just a few videos watching him yeah, it'd be interesting to see for, uh, how hard it would be to create a game in this. Might not be. Well, he makes apps. He makes apps, but I would say you could do games too easily. Yeah. If you looks... search on LinkedIn, there are a lot of people that advertise that Flutter is you know something they can do. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like they have like buttons and GUI components and things like that. But yeah, I'm gonna have to look more into. Flutter and Dart and learn more about those. Oh, it looks like uh, Jared joined us. Hey, Jared, are you there? Uh, Jared must be muted. Yeah. Oh, hey. Yeah, we're just I, we're just about to wrap up here. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about the time change until yeah. like just now. So I thought I was well, they really they started a couple minutes early. Well, they're at the <laughs> end. <laughs> Yeah, that seems to happen every year. Time change, and yeah, it can. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're able to join us here at the end. Uh, did you have anything that you you've been working on, or that you wanted to show off? Well, not really. I've kind of been in between ideas, trying to put them together. Um, put together what a plan of what what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so I've been thinking about. Thinking about revisiting a city builder idea I had a few years ago, back when I just was kind of assuming making a game meant making an engine for each game. Now that I actually have an engine made by experts just try and make the game in it. Or something similar, maybe something simpler than what I imagined back then. Yeah, I know you've been showing off a lot of your the stuff that you've been working on. I was just going to show this off. I know you've been doing some texturing here. And doing some 3D modeling. Are you still using Blender? Learning that? Yeah, I'm using Blender 2.8. Okay. Uh, I probably should work on it a bit more. I tend to not do it because there's there's some the version of Linux that I need to use the new Blender version has something about the way it's set up is not right, and some actual games don't work. And like my um, OBS doesn't work if I want to make a video of something. Oh, okay. So I have to like switch back and forth, like dual boot between Linux and Linux because the it needs Mint 18 or I guess some similar version of Ubuntu to really use or it uses newer libraries to use the new Blender, but then OBS doesn't work in that version for some reason. Something about the way they change the drivers, they don't like old monitors anymore. Oh, so yeah. OBS doesn't work in it. Minecraft is really weird in it. Flicker, so I to actually play a game or to record a video, I go back to the old Linux, and then I have to go back to the new Linux in order to do models. Yeah, I do have like one of my systems in dual boot mode, so I can go between like Ubuntu and Mint. But it's been a long time since I've updated either one of those. I think I'm still on the LTS version of Ubuntu, but I, I know I need to update because it's it's so old. But yeah, I've never tried running OBS under Linux before. I think I've used uh, obviously, like web browsers and GIMP and things like that, and I think Blender, but uh, but yeah, yeah. hopefully uh, OBS will update their stuff and get those Linux uh, issues fixed there. I, I know you're also working on some texturing. 
making different yeah. textures. Yeah, I have a bunch of textures. Um, see if I can find. Yeah, making good textures is definitely an art, um, especially if you make them like where they wrap properly and and things like that. Yeah, that can be tricky, and it's really hard to get where you don't where it doesn't become obvious at a distance. But unless you just make them really, really flat. Yeah. But I have a bunch of different stone textures. Stone textures are relatively easy because they just look kind of relatively smooth and I have a couple of wood textures I got a lot of them I got by just taking pictures of of like like the wood is from my deck and I I started out with some bricks I kind of did by hand but I also have bricks that I made by taking a picture of the side of the house and cutting it and editing it yeah I know GIMP has a nice tool because I've done that something similar for my Ludum Dari games I'll go out and like take a picture uh, of something a brick or the concrete and then blender you can go into uh the the filters and then you can say make seamless but i think the default uh make seamless doesn't always work properly so i think there's like an add-on you can get called make seamless advanced and then you can kind of specify how much overlap there is on each other because it tries to like fade out each side and 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 then like interpolate it or or do the the transparency gradient where they kind of overlap to make it look like one continuous image. Yeah, if you have something like like a stone that doesn't really have a really obvious pattern, it, it's the default works pretty well. Mm -hmm. But if you have something like bricks, then you got to get it kind of the right size and have a bit of luck to make it pretty good, and then you still are gonna have to kind of go in and edit it and you know maybe cut a cut a little piece of mortar out and and paste it back in in order to try and make all the mortar for the doesn't necessarily the way it does it on the sides doesn't necessarily make it a good brick pattern by See, this is kind of like what I do when I'm doing a Ludum Dari game Ex except I actually go out and take a picture but I'll just go in here and like edit paste as new image and then like go out and like do a square like that or so let's see here I forget how you get an exact square but basically you go in here and say image and crop to selection Ooh, that didn't work right let's see here yeah a lot of times for a square I just get an approximate square that looks close enough and then I just resize it to a square yeah, you just can't tell a lot of difference. So I think you can also like play around with the like the canvas size. So you can go image, uh, canvas size, and just say like five twelve. Oops, five twelve by five twelve resize. Then you can go in, go to filters, then map tile seamless then okay that should give you a seamless tile but you, you always notice like the the artifacts in here from where it's been the transparencies overlapping which doesn't always look good uh but yeah i used to have like a make seamless advanced which i don't think i have it installed on this one uh where you could actually play play around with how much overlap that you have and yeah. And, no tile. and then I also made some maps that are kind of based on the bricks where I've extracted like the mortar. Mm -hmm. So then I can also put those over top of other stone materials and make it look like a different kind of brick. Oh, that's cool. That's a good idea. Yeah, I know there's a lot of different things you can do. To, yeah, and that's one thing is like yeah, if you have a game, you don't want all the walls looking the same. That's one thing I need to go back and do and. And the game that I'm working on, because kind of all the levels look the same, so I need to add some variety and things like that. And then the other thing I was doing a little bit of was just experimenting with making um, height maps. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see if I can do that. I, I haven't done much with height maps. Uh, I always get confused between a height map and a bump map. Are they Are they basically the same, or...? Oh, no, no, these are for terrains. Oh, terrains. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I'm trying to see if I can remember how to do that. 
Yeah, if you can share that out, that'd be great. If not, it's okay too. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out camera, no camera. Don't have to figure If you, uh, I always like. Share screen. Yeah. There should be like three dots. Like if you hover in the upper right corner, then share screen. Okay, this should work. There you share go. Screen. So. Cool. So if so, I go, I need to go to. So I see you're using your source. using the J Monkey engine here. Yep. So yeah. I'll probably try to get out of a different engine in a minute. Oh, there this looks cool. A minute, but see. That the water is just like a flat quad. So if I go underneath it, all of a sudden it just disappears right now. But. Yeah, getting so, water. This rendering. is basically just a three by three, five twelve by five twelve. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not infinite or anything. It's it's five twelve by five twelve, and then I have a three by three grid of them that I've just I made in order to figure out how to get them to line up correctly because at first they didn't want to do that. Oh, I had okay. a few bugs that made them look where they looked okay by themselves, but then they didn't line up. So how are you specifying so your height map? Are you just going in I'm with doing. an editor or something and specifying that? Or or do you have a tool to no, actually... No, there's something like that built in, but I'm generating it. That I wrote... Where, which one of these did I put it in? A, I, they have a version where you can uh, create height maps with like a... Uh, like GIMP as a texture, mm -hmm. but that's not what I'm doing. I use let's see, Flatland is not what I'm basic noise. I I have created. Let me go over to noise. Yeah, because I know that Unity has a built-in like terrain height map editor, but it isn't always the best because sometimes you got to really play around with the settings to get it not too sensitive or not sensitive enough and and things like that. But yeah, I it's I wrote this here that's kind of like a, a derivative it's a close cousin or mostly a derivative of Perlin noise mm -hmm. so it goes in and it, it creates height maps by you know how Perlin noise works no I don't per well, uh, basically what it does is each corner of like a, a grid section is assigned a height of zero and a random slope. And then it figures that out and it kind of does a weighted average of the as, of where the slope would be from each of those points. Mm -hmm. And then to make it more complex, it it does it in different scales, cutting the scale, like the size of the grid and the heights in half and just adds them together. And that makes a more complex looking pattern. Oh, okay. So that's what... This guy. Very cool. And yeah, this is. I never knew how height maps their were height map, and it creates that. Yeah, there are several ways. There's value maps where it's just like a random value, and the averages, and they may also make what they call sometimes called fractal, where they have different scales. But Perlin noise is based on assigning random slopes in a di certain directions, and that make. Instead of just having like this, like it go like a line, and I'm over here gesturing that you can't see, it it's because the slope changes, it makes more of a smooth curve because it's not just the height changing, it's the slope changing, so it kind of curves and bends around more. Oh, okay, very cool. Yeah, I know very little about height maps, but I know they're used in a lot of games these days. I mean, any game that you have out there, pretty much any first person shooter or adventure game and yeah yeah it's all just one big grid and i guess it's just this assigning like uh different float values for the height at different locations but yeah i never knew the algorithms or anything behind that for generating a good height map because you don't want to have somebody you don't want to be enclosed by a mountain or anything where you can't get out and go anywhere so very cool. Do well, you have anything yeah, else? That's kind of a way they get created yeah. for random worlds. But I mean, if 
of course, if you want to actually create one, you're probably going to use more like the textures or the editors. No, no I, I mean, technically, I've start. Technically, I've started on the city builder, but by started on, I mean it makes a single flat terrain and does nothing. It's just basically I've set up the project and nothing else. Oh uh, well, at least you got a good start there, and if you work on it some more, <laughs> you let us know and. We'll take a look at it and everything. But, yeah, the one thing that I've always had problems with height maps is, like, you can't do, like, caves or anything like that. Like, I was working on, like, a, a Georgia Tech campus, and it has, like, bridges that you can go under. And then there's actually, like, a tunnel that goes under the interstate. So there's, like, no way to do a hole. So it's almost like you got to model any tunnel or bridge yourself and just add that in after you've done your height map. Yeah, that's that's a problem with those types of height maps is any kind of other geometry you have to like do as a model or if it's really complex you just have to throw it out and use a model. Yeah. If you have lots of things at caves. I mean if you have something like a a a, a block or voxel world, you can kind of there are ways you can generate those with caves using height maps by like combining different ones in different ways, but it's not really a it's not really a height map you end up in the end. It's a bunch of boxes. But just basic height maps, you can't really have caves or cliffs or overhangs. Everything is hills and mountains and valleys. Kind of more smooth. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting stuff. Well, I guess that's going to wrap it up for March 2020, unless anybody... I have one more thing. Oh, I you have one, one more thing? thing? Okay, go for it, Rita. Yeah. I just searched on John... Manning, Flutter, and a bunch of links came up. So you can probably look oh, at those okay. uh, oh, videos. Okay. Too. It's J-O-H-N-M-A-N-N-I-N-G-F-L-U-T-T-E-R. John Manning, Flutter. I'm using DuckDuckGo. Uh, is it amia.org? Uh, I don't know what he is. But the ones with Google that came up is like, welcome... Fluttering. Oh no, that's somebody else. Sorry. Um, yeah, he's on. Comes out. John Manning. John. MD. Yeah, that's him. Oh, okay. How to make health apps in Android? I. Oh, this sounds very cool. Register now. Oh yeah. <laughs> so well, the, I, is there a feed if, to watch it? Uh, no, there shouldn't be. Oh okay. This must no. be if you want to see it in person or something. Yeah. Uh, if th there there were several links that came up when I did it with oh. Google, but um, but if you can't find anything, you can uh, message me somehow, and I'll oh, okay. I'll get you oh, some okay. better links. John Manning, MD, Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I'll definitely add a link to this. Maybe we can check out oh, the Koei Pond. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll look it, look up look it up later and see if I can get a link to those okay. presentations there and link it to our website. Okay. Sounds good. So that's going to wrap it up for March 2020 for Knoxville Game Design. Appreciate everyone uh, watching and listening. Check out knoxgamedesign.org. Uh, you can find links to the Discord channel if you need to chat with any of us that's the best way to get a hold of us is on the discord channel we are we're also on social media Knox game design so yeah that's gonna wrap it up yeah have some few topics that i kind of brainstormed i want to do uh pi game python and pi game i may do that next month depending on how busy i am <laughs> uh, then then in april or in may we'll do the ludum dare 46 show off because the Ludum Dari 46, will, I think it will be after uh, the April meeting. And then after that, I'm thinking about doing Mono Game. Because I think I want to take that C code that I did for the SDL shooter and port that over to Mono Game. So anyway, appreciate everyone listening and watching.